Hi everyone, uh, we are Team 5 and we will be giving a presentation of uh, understanding operations on Apple 5. I'm the team manager, Chen. Uh, I'm Nan, I'm my master. I'm Ken Young, I'm presentation prep. I'm Alex, I'm document prep. I'm Pat Farrers, I'm lab coordinator. And this is an outline of our presentation, and I will be talking about the history of operation in Apple 5. And Patrick will talk about uh, up and construction. And Alex will give a uh, introduction of operational amplified application circuits. And Ken will talk about the effect of input offset uh, voltage. And I will wrap up with effect of through packaging, and he will also give the conclusion. And in history, uh, The, the first vacuum tube op came out in 1941. op which was defined as um, DC coupled, general purpose, high gain, and a built amplifier was first found in US patent as summary amplifier. And that was followed by Carl Swazo in 1941. This particular op consists of three vacuum tubes, and uh, it operates uh, on a voltage rail of positive and negative 350 volts. It has a gain of 90 dB. And uh, that particular op amp has only one inverting input instead of differential inverting and non-inverting inputs, which are very common today. And the first op amp with no inverting input came out in 1947. And the world operation amplifier was actually defined and named in a paper written by John Ragazzini. And, uh, and, and in his paper, he made two major innovations. The first was he, he used a long tail trial pair uh, with low math to reduce the drift in the output. And, and far more importantly, he, he designed two inputs, one inverting and the other non inverting. And the first chopper stabilized op amp, which was designed by Edwin Goldberg, came out in 1949. And chopper stabilized op amp. Uh, consists of a, a general op amp and a AC amplifier along with it. So the chopper gets a AC signal by switching DC to the ground at a very fast rate. And the AC signal is then amplified, rectified, and filtered and fed back into the uh, non inverting input of the op amp. And that vastly improved the gain and also a significant. Significantly reduce the 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 uh, DC output, uh, the DC drift in the amp. And the discrete IC op amp came, uh, was produced in 1961. Um, the with a burst of transistor in 1947, and the uh, and the burst of silicon transistor in 1954. The uh, the idea of integrated circuit became a reality. And, and with the introduction of final processing in 1959, transistor and integrated circuits became uh, stable enough to be commercialized. So in 1961, discrete IC op amps were produced. They usually have small circuit board with packages such as edge connector. And uh, they usually have hand selected resistor to reduce the DC offset and drift. And the first monolithic IC op amp, which was designed by Bob Wheeler, and the particular mo monolithic IC op amp was called the 702. And that was released in 1963. And a monolithic IC op amp, as opposed to discrete IC op amp, consists only one chip. And almost all the modern op amps are monolithic IC op amps. And high speed, low input current uh, op amps were achieved using fair design. And that was in 1970, and followed by 1980s, all the fat design was uh, was replaced by MOSFET, and that uh, improved the performance of uh, op amp even more. Um, single sided supply op amp was produced in 1972. A single sided supply op amp 
is an op-amp which is in, in, input and output can can be as low as the uh, negative power supply instead of two volts above it. So the negative power supply pin can be connected to the ground, and that eliminates the need for a uh, separate negative power supply. And that's a brief history of op-amp, and I will pass to Patrick to talk about the construction of op-amp. Hi, I'm Pat. I'm going to talk about the op amp construction. And when you talk about op amps, you break them down into two major categories. That means linear, same thing, provide amplification for an uh, input signal, and that they're monolithic, as Cheng discussed, uh, which means one stone. So we're going to put all our components onto a discrete, or uh, to a piece of semiconductor, a single piece. Next slide. So when you talk about you know the design and construction of op amps, it seems prudent to talk about the 741 is one of the most popular selling op amps ever made. I'm going to break down. This is an internal schematic of the data sheet of the 741. I'm going to break this down and talk about the biasing circuit, the input stage, the intermediate stage or gain stage, the output stage, and the short circuit protection. Before I do that, we got to think about monolithic building blocks. When you talk about these, they're not discrete. Components. They're actually layers of uh, dope semiconductor material with a metallization on the surface. So you have your transistor, your diode, your resistor, and your capacitor as some examples. So with biasing circuit, when you have two transistors connected at the base like such, uh, they're called current mirrors, which they can be thought of as current control current sources. So a special relevance for this circuit is this uh, multi-collector lateral PMP transistor here. Uh, this is a current mirror, a special type of current mirror called Whittler mirror. And uh, what makes the Whittler mirror is this resistor off the emitter right there. So this can have special biasing for the stages here. And this will have special biasing for the input stage. Next slide. So they can be idealized uh, based off there was a reference current there that was going to bias the entire uh, schematic. And through these relationships, you can idealize these current control current sources such that this is going to bias the input stage, this is biasing the intermediate stage, and this is biasing the output stage as well as short circuit protection uh, through these relationships. Next slide. So for the input stage, these two transistors are called emitter followers, or also known as common collector amplifiers. Um, they're going to provide the high impedance to the inputs. Uh, these two transistors are common base uh, PMP uh, transistors. They have a higher uh, base to emitter breakdown than the NPNs, so you can apply a, a very high input to them without breaking down the based on their junction. Um, this here is another current mirror, but it's considered an active load. It's not dependent on the power supply. It's dependent on the changes in the input voltages. So it has more of a dynamic response than a, than a passive load would have. So the difference of the inputs is going to be uh, become a, a dual. The differential relationship is going to become a single-ended uh, signal proportional to the difference in the voltage through this node right here, and it's going to be translated into the intermediate stage. Excellent. This is kind of summarization of what I just talked about. Uh, so for the intermediate stage, this is another emitter follower or common collector amplifier. It's going to provide uh, high impedance from the input stage, just not to load down the gain that, was, that, you, that we got from this stage. And, uh, it's, it's in a Darlington pair <laughs> configuration so that, uh, and then it's uh, translated to the common emitter amplifier, which is going to be, uh, give you a gain proportional to the transconductance of this transistor as well as the output resistance of this transistor. And uh, it's approximately 200,000 uh, in magnitude. And uh, this is what separated the 741 from all its predecessors, uh, was this uh, transistor here. It's called compensation capacitor. It's going to give you stabilization and frequent response for the entire circuit. It's going to put a pole at about 5 hertz. So for your open loop gain, it's going to take a, 
a decrease of about five hertz, and continue on down at a, at a attenuation rate of minus 20 dB per decade. And so from there, it gets transmitted to the output stage. Next slide. Again, there's the summarization what I just talked about. So for the output stage, another common, uh, rather emitter follower, common collector, high impedes not to load down the intermediate stage, and then it's going to uh, send that input to a push-pull complementary pair, or a class AB amplifier. So this can take care of the positive swing in the output signal, this can take care of the negative swing. This is a Darlington pair that kind of acts as two dyes in series, often used when you're using a common, or a class AB amplifier, as you know that if you've taken other courses with Weir's where he talks about crossover distortion, where you're not going to perfectly meet uh, at the, the zero level there. Um, so this will provide that smooth transition between the crossover distortion. Next slide. And this is another summarization, what I just discussed. So for short circuit protection, these transistors are normally off, but if for any uh, circumstance these transistors start conducting more current than they're allowed, approximately 25 uh, milliamps, this is gonna it's gonna go through these resistors and provide a, a voltage drop of about 0.675 volts, which will turn on these transistors and then bleed off that current through these two transistors, another current mirror, and kind of provide feedback to the entire circuit. And I'm another summarization of what I just discussed, and I'm going to turn it over to Alex, who's going to talk about applications. Um, I'm Alex. I'm going to talk about some of the applications of op amps. Um, typically, when you're doing op amp design, you want to look at the ideal parameters of op amps, which is uh, zero input current, uh, zero offset current, which is the current between the two um, non inverting and inverting inputs. Um, you also want uh, infinite input impedance, uh, zero output impedance, and an infinite gain. And this is going to help you uh, in designing. <clears throat> so a simple, uh, simple circuit is a buffer circuit or voltage follower. This takes an input in the non-inverting input, and if you uh, connect the inverting input to the output, um, it should follow the voltage and not load uh, the input with the output. Um, this is a typical 8-pin op-amp layout. Um, they also come with <coughs> dual and quad packages. Um, so some typical applications <coughs> are the non-inverting and inverting amplifiers. Uh, the non-inverting right here adds a gain of uh, 1 plus the uh, difference of the or the division of the resistors, RF and RG. Uh, the inverting amplifier um, gives you just the, the division of RF and RG, but it uh, inverts the waveform. Um, this, this can be a problem with some circuits, but uh, with things like audio, uh, it'll just create a, a time delay in the circuit, or in the, in the sound. Um, <clears throat> so this is an adder and a differential circuit. Um, an adder is a good circuit for um, adding multiple inputs if you want a uh, high impedance input and uh, an addition of the inputs at the output. Um, that also inverts the output. Um, this is a differential amplifier. It takes the difference of uh, V1 and V2 and then puts a gain of R4 over R3. Um, this is a non-inverting summing amplifier, and the transfer function is a little tricky, but if you use the same resistor values for all resistors, um, you'll get a gain of two here and one half here and here. So it'll actually just be V1 plus V2, and we use this circuit in our design uh, to add a DC offset to an AC signal, and that works really well. Um, um, another application is the integrator. Um, the integrator is a simple 
uh, op amp circuit that has a capacitor from the inverting input to ground. Um, if you input a square wave, it'll integrate it into a triangle. So that's uh, signal processing. Um, and then last, I'm going to talk about the active filter design. Um, these are two Butterworth filters. This one is passive, this one is active. Uh, the active filter allows you um, to not use an inductor in the circuit, which can be noisy in, uh, in electronics. So uh, this is a good, a good thing to have. Um, I'm going to pass it to Ken now. He's going to talk about the specifications. Okay, so I'm uh, Ken Young. Uh, Alex just talked about the ideal op amp. I'm going to talk a little bit about two specifications that you see on the spec sheet. Uh, about non-ideal op amps and how you're going to compensate for them and how to understand them. So two specifications which we chose to look at were input offset voltage and slew rate. So typically on a data sheet like for the LM741, the first, the first uh, thing that you'll see on many data sheets is the input offset voltage. So on the 741, <coughs> typical input offset voltage is one millivolt, maximum five. I'm going to go into what exactly that is. Next. And one of the last things you'll see on a data sheet typically is the slew rate. We're going to talk about that. LM740, uh, 741 has a slew rate of half a volt per microsecond. Okay. So input offset voltage, what is that? So a differential amplifier, so all op amps, that's what they are, differential amplifiers, they amplify the differential voltage between the inputs. So in theory, if you have an op amp in which you short the inputs together, you should have zero output voltage, right? Because there's no difference in the inputs. But in reality, that's not the case because of input offset voltage. So if you take a real op amp, like 741, short the inputs together, it's likely that you could go saturation uh, to one of the supply rails. Next slide. So this is a very simplified uh, op amp diagram. So Pat went over this, but I'm gonna talk about this in terms of input offset voltage. So in a, in a typical op amp, you're really working with the current balance, okay? So here's your input stage. One thing to notice is these two transistors. Their bases are in parallel, uh, their, excuse me, base to emitter is in parallel for each one of these transistors. So if these two transistors are in active mode and they have the exact same base to emitter voltage, then they must have the same current going through here in this transistor and going through here in this transistor. So at all times, the current going through this part of the circuit must be equal. Up here is where you have your inputs from your uh, negative input and your positive input on these two transistors, which are exactly the same also. If your negative input and your positive input is the same, so they're shorted together, then you should have the same voltage on the base of this transistor as on the base of this transistor. Their currents should be identical. Those two identical currents will then go through these transistors, and there will be no current going in or out of the second stage. So therefore, you should have a zero gain. If the negative or positive inputs are slightly different, the voltage on the base of these two transistors are going to be, going to be slightly different. You're going to have a slight current imbalance. The current which goes through these transistors, although, will be the same. So the difference in current between this side and this side is going to either go in, into uh, the second stage if it's a positive imbalance, or out of the second stage if it's a negative imbalance. So that's how you, that's how you have your, uh, um, your, your differential input amplification. The problem with input offset voltage is that none of these transistors are ever exactly the same. There's always a slight variation. It's kind of like how resistors have a nominal value and they have a tolerance. Well, if these transistors are not exactly the same, and these transistors are not exactly the same, don't have the same doping levels, didn't come off the same lot, et cetera, et cetera, they're going to have slight differences, even if you have the same base to emitter voltage across two transistors, they could have different collector currents. That's going to cause an error in your circuit. So how you model this is an imbalance in your transistors is kind of like having a little voltage on one of your inputs, and it can be anywhere from 0 to 10 millivolts. So in the 741, it said on the, it said on the data sheet that it had a typical uh, value of 1 millivolt for input offset voltage. So that's kind of like on your op amp, this is an ideal op amp, you always have a one millivolt voltage right on your right on one of the, in, the inputs. 
And because the imbalance can be with either one of those transistors I showed, this can be on this side, it can be on this side, you can flip it over. So that, that's how you model an input offset voltage on an ideal uh, op amp. Slide. So the effective input offset voltage, we're going to go over a uh, non-inverting uh, non gain. So this is just an example of something Alex showed. This is the equation. If you have, if you have an ideal op amp, 50 millivolts going in, these are your resistance values. Here's your equation. You're going to have 100 times amplification. You're going to have 5 volts in the output. But let's say we have an op amp, and we're going to take into account the input offset voltage. And let's say it's between the nominal value and the maximum value on 741, which is 3 millivolts. How is that going to affect your circuit if you have 100 times gain? Well, the uh, input offset voltage is also going to be multiplied by 100. So if you have your input offset voltage as displayed here, instead of having a 5 volt output, you're going to have a 5.3 volt output. Equally, the imbalance between the transistors could be in the other direction. So you flip this over, and then you get a 4.7 volt output. So if you have a circuit in which you need high DC precision, you're going to have trouble with input offset voltage. Or you could potentially have trouble. There are different ways of uh, nulling it out next. So on a 741, a lot of you, if you've seen the schematic, you've probably seen these two pins here, null pins. And in the data sheet, they also show how to use those. So I'm going to explain how you actually use those null pins. Okay. Watch your time. What? Time. Good. Okay. It's 2145 right now. Okay. Uh, so this is the uh, Allen 741 schematic. Uh, that's on the data sheet. We're just going to look at the input section. Um, the input section is very close to the generalized input, which I showed. It's the same type of thing. You just have uh, more transistors for, uh, for to increase the impedance. And uh, this down here is the exact same as this transistor configuration, except you have this added on to eliminate the input offset voltage. Okay. So what the uh, data sheet suggests that you do is uh, hook up a 10K potentiometer with a center tapped to uh, negative VCC. So that's going to go on here like this. Okay. So if you have an imbalance in your transistors, which causes, in which when you, your non-inverting input and inverting input are the same voltage, you have a slight different current in one of these sides, you can move the center tap of this, of this uh, potentiometer to one side or the other, and the parallel resistance between this side of the potentiometer and this resistor, or this side of the potentiometer and this resistor, is either going to increase or decrease, so you can bleed off more current on one side than on the other, so you can get your balance so that, so that when you have equal voltages on the input and off, or excuse me, so that when you have these two voltages shorted, you're going to have zero current going in or out into the second stage. That's it for me. Okay, hi, I'm Nan. I will talk about the effect of the three. Uh, the series of the op amp is a uh, output change. Uh, output change is expressed by volts per microsecond. Uh, for uh, for example, a seven forty five. If the uh, input is a pulse signal, the output should be like this. The slope here is a uh, thread. If the thread goes high, the the slope here will go to the vertical, which is close to the input. So uh, the the slope here, which is 0.5 volts per microsecond, is a thread. And uh, the maximum frequency input sine wave, which can be applied before the three distor distortion. Uh, for the sine wave, the derivative of sine wave is a, a voltage change by the time. How can we know the maximum uh, voltage change? On the slope, the maximum is a cross section here, which, when, which is a time is equal to zero. When t equals zero, the, this part is one. So the equation can also be seen like this. The maximum is 2 pi f. And uh, how do we know the maximum frequency before the distortion? We can use this equation, the 10 to the 6 times the 3 divided by 2 pi. Uh, why do we need to times the 10 to the 6? Because the unit of the 3 is uh, volts per microsecond. We need to convert to the second for the frequency. Uh, for the purchasing, purchasing all time, we need to know the package and mount type before we purchase the correct op-amp. Uh, there are three different packages. 
on the market. The first one is doing a package with the regular standard package we are using on the lab. It looks like this. Excuse me. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Your time's up. Okay. And uh, the second one is uh, smaller body size, smaller pitches, and uh, it's thin. It's like 0.9 millimeters thin. And the third one is macro small outlet package. It's only three, mil three millimeter by three millimeter body. And it's <coughs> this small thing here. And the whole, this whole thing is a socket. And uh, on the mount type, there are two mount types, the surface mount and the through hole. As the, all the uh, SOPs <coughs> are surface mount. It's like uh, you put the components on the surface of the PCB. You don't need a hole drilled on the PCBs. And uh, you can also use uh, this kind of socket which turns the surface mount into the through hole. For the through hole, is a uh, regular uh, chips we are using. And also we can use this kind of socket, which the benefit is if the op amp is not working or damaged, we can change it, just pull it out. Uh, for the conclusion, Chen has talked about the history of the op amp. And Patrick talked about the construction design, construction and design, the schematic of the LPAM. And Alex talked about the LPAM applications with some application examples. And uh, Ken talked about the effect of input offset voltage and uh, the looping on the chips. And I talked about the circuit and package. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I think we'll have to move forward, so thanks.